Hi, and welcome to our Back to Work series. We have yet another exciting expert here to talk with us. Uh, we are discussing today with a neurologist, a brain expert, or I don't know, she gets to introduce herself in a minute, Kitty Müller. Warmly welcome. Would you like to say a few words about yourself? First, because it's hard for me. You, there's so many things that one could say about you. Okay, so first of all, thank you for inviting me to this session. And uh, I'm a medical doctor and neurologist by training, but starting from the beginning of 1990s, when I finished my PhD in neuroimmunology, I was looking outside the window to the other side of the street, and I saw the Finnish Institute of Occupational Health there. And I was thinking, what does the clinical neuroscience department do there? And I decided to go and ask. Mm -hmm. And then I spent 24, 25 years there doing applied neu neuroscience and clinical work in the context of working life. Mm -hmm. So I saw the change from, you know, um, people doing traditional ways of like banking. Mm -hmm. And then the computers came and you had to learn computer skills and so forth. And everything started to become more and more digitized. And then we put up the Brain and Work Research Center, where we wanted to start studying new things related to work, working life, like how people use computers, shift work, uh, uh, work that you know is irregular working hours, uh, work with changing paces and so forth. And then when I was about 60 years old, I got an invitation from Nokia Research Center that would you like to come and join us? And then I thought that this is an opportunity that I won't get another time. So then I left my research professorship in Finnish Institute of Occupational Health and spent five and a half years at Nokia and doing applied research there. And now I have been so-called freelancer uh, researcher because I was thinking that now perhaps is the time of my life when I can, you know, start, I have the possibility to help and mentor younger mm -hmm. people and, and be a part of different types of research projects without having, you know, the task of being the principal investigator and mm -hmm. doing all the bureaucracy. So now I really am inspired in coming to situations like this because this is something that I've missed and now I have the opportunity. Fantastic. So it's a win-win because it's... I am really excited to have you here and, um, well, we all are. And I think that I can't think of a better expert to ask this following question, the same question I've asked everyone in our series so far, which is that from your perspective now we're talking all of this expertise you have on brains and, and brains at work and the change that you've seen. What should we focus on in, in kind of when we're looking forward if we want to build a more sort of socially sustainable future of work? I think that the most important thing is the human being. And I've often tried to put forward my message, which is that uh, ultimately in the society and in different workplaces, be it private enterprises or public sector or so forth, it's in the end the people, the people who care, who are willing to uh, be motivated to, to solve big and small problems, they are those who keep the society and all the different, uh, different workplaces running. So I think that the most important thing now, for now and for the future is, from my perspective, that I myself try to bring forward the knowledge that I have gained through research and, and everyday you know, life mm. and what are the relevant things that people should take into account when they take care of themselves because that's the ultimate thing. And I think that is something that doesn't change even if our you know, working environment can be hugely different, let's say in 10 or 15 years. Still, people have to take care of themselves. And I think you should learn that from a very early age and remember to update your you know, knowledge on what things are relevant for human well-being because the well-being is a holistic thing. The brain is not an isolated island up there, you know, within the skull. It is very much connected to bodily functions and physiology and biology. So we have to take care of the biophysiology and metabolism because that's the platform for good brain work and, and that your cognition and your cognitive uh, performance is at its best. 
And we face a lot of our challenges at the moment, one of which is this 24-7 open society where you can, you know, forget this, you know, traditional day-night thing. So if we want to take care of our brain, looking forward, like looking forward, looking to, towards the future of work, we need to take care of our well-being more holistically. Yes. What else can we do? What to focus on in terms of your brain health? I think that, uh, first of all, the most important thing is that you, eval you, you value your, your, your brain bank, because all the knowledge that you have is within the different memory structures that you have within your brain. And this is something unique for each individual. You can never take it away from somebody. I mean, your workplace can change and you can do d different things. But the thing that you always have with you is the knowledge that you have stored in, in your brain memory structures. And another thing that I very much like to talk about is the fa fact that we actually have the best tools also with us, our hands, and our feet. I mean, if we don't have, you know, cars or we don't have other transportation, we can always go with our feet. If we, you know, don't have tools that we would need, we have the most flexible and best tool in our own hands. So we have to take care of all of these different uh, tools with which we can always manage, even if, you know, we are for all of a sudden, let's say, in the wilderness and the only thing that we can, you know, have to go forward is our mind, our ability to understand and navigate in the forest, for instance, and our hands and feet to go forward. So what I'm hearing is that more holistic thinking, more holistic thinking in terms of your well-being and the way you use your body and yourself, and that will then also translate into a better brain health. But I think that if I, if I kind of, we're all under quite a lot of strain right now, We've just been discussing before we started this interview, potential new restrictions, how they impact our work here, your work, mine. And you have written about digitalization of working life and education and uh, in remote mode. You, you pointed out that it's not new, but what's new and different now that we, what we've experienced for the past 22 months, maybe, is this isolation. So, um, what's the sort of uh, how are how is what's the impact of this on our brains on on us? So this is one of the basic and relevant issues, also related to taking care of yourself. Understanding that, uh, in order to you know, develop, learn new things. Every day we learn new things. So, when we go to bed in the evening. During the daytime, we have learned something new, and, and during sleep, this is integrated to the already there uh, memory structures. But in order to, you know, learn as much as possible that we have the ability to do, we need other people. We need the interaction with other people, because very often the best sort of um, ideas and innovations and solutions to problems come through thinking aloud together with other people. And this thinking aloud is not just, you know, words. You know, listening and, and what another person is saying and, you know, responding with words. Actually, approximately at least 40, perhaps even up to 60% of the information that we are transferring to the other person is nonverbal. It comes from our facial expressions, how we use our hands, uh, our body, body uh, functions and movements. And all of these things are very important. And if we go into a remote mode, where we are working remotely, and we are all the time having interaction with others only through small screens where you just see the talking head so forth, you lose a lot of the natural way of communicating with other people. And I think that natural communication is very important because it also gives you the opportunity to relate emotionally and with empathy to other people. This, this emotional relating and empathy are things that are very difficult at the moment to transfer via, let's say, virtual, virtual solutions. I think a sort of a emoji or what, whatever you call it, a happy face or a not so happy face, it's, you know, it's, nothing compared to what we can sort of uh, 
tr transfer through this type of naturalistic setting in which we are to today together at the moment. I'm all the time sort of looking at you and sort of also uh, reacting to what you are saying and looking at uh, and sort of thinking that um, are you sort of a question mark for me or are you agreeing with something mm. and so forth? And I think that is very important. And now I have to, now that I have the opportunity, I have to tell you a very, uh, very sort of um, recent experience. So I have been giving lectures, speeches, and been uh, during this corona lockdown time via Teams and Zoom and so forth. And I have also tried to uh, try to um, help my students through this. But now, in the couple of last months, I've been in live presentations. Last yesterday, I was talking to uh, teachers. And I have had live Teams, uh, teams uh, sessions with students and other research. We have, been in, we have shared the same time and space. It's such a totally different situation in terms of the interaction with each other. It's sort of natural, for instance, yesterday to see when somebody was commenting what I was saying and throwing into the, uh, into the uh, air a sort of a thought ball. And somebody else grabbed the thought ball and continued discussion from that. I never experienced this type of interaction, uh, or it was very rare when we had this Zoom and Teams, I tried to use, you know, this thumb there, and somebody tried to, you know, wave. I'd like to have, you know, my say next. But often they said, oh, well, you went already, hurried along. Um, I don't have anything to say at the moment. It, it felt so unnatural. And I think that we are very far from getting these, these uh, technologies, this digital, to the stage that it feels as natural communication between individuals. And for human well-being, and for growing and learning new things, this natural interaction, uh, mentoring each other when we are face to face is very important. I was just going to ask that could we, is it possible to say that uh, our thinking becomes better with the other people? So I, I remember I've read an article about this that uh, where a professor was commenting that there's something in our brain that comes alive with other people with stimulation, changing situations. So is there actually sort of like a, a scientific argument that we are better, we think better if we are there in the same space, if we can read each other and react? I have read research, um, research papers on this issue also. And I think it has to do with the fact that if you are all the time, when we are thinking, we are actually talking with ourselves. We are sort of thinking about things, and it's very easy to get into a sort of a circle, a thought circle, where you don't uh, sort of realize new possibilities to new ways of uh, looking at a certain thing. But when you are talking with another person, then, the, then you have also the other person's sort of unique knowledge that the person has in his or her brain in addition to your own. And so you can combine them together and then it's usually much more sort of, it has a much more sort of um, lively and vivid angle of, of issues. And it's often so that we have some things that, um, I, often, I often describe it as, a, as um, our, our, our brain processes, if one would say it like that, that uh, it's never, the brain function is never a, a sort of a still lake. There's always something going underlie, under it. And it, this is the sort of unconscious level also of our thinking. And there might be some thoughts that are trying to, you know, come up over the surface, but you are so into looking at things at a, at, at a certain in a certain way, that you don't see that a bit on the side, something is, you know, trying to come up, and you don't notice it, because you are all the time discussing with yourself. But when you are discussing with another person, they might, you know, give a thought that's like a rock that, you know, goes down into the lake near the place where your thoughts were trying to come up. And then they combine, and then you all of a sudden realize, Wow, yes, that's actually a very good point that you pointed out. And um, 
one thing that I've also been thinking about is that we very much think about these uh, people are in their own cocoons and information bubbles. And I think this is an area that we have to take seriously because, of course, we have these search engines. We have, you know, it's very common for people to say, I have to consult now Dr. Google. Well, Dr. Google has an algorithm that knows very well what you would like to hear. So when you consult it, it usually says what you want to hear, even if it would be better for, let's say, your health, that you would hear something else. And if you are not aware of this, you are very much more enforcing your way of thinking when you are just, you know, interacting with non-human intelligence. But when you are talking with another person, you very soon get a different perspective. And then you can, for instance, together go and ask Dr. Google. You can both have your computer, ask Dr. Google, and then you can start, you know, wondering together why you two got totally different answers. I very often notice this with my husband, who is a for forest pathologist. When he, we put the same keywords, he gets different information. And even if I go and use his computer and he uses my computer, for some reason, this very intelligent, non-human system knows that now I'm using my husband's computer and I'm trying to, you know, trick it. And I think that we have to be really conscious about this and the only way to, you know, um, the best way to counteract this that we get into these bubbles is to talk with different people with different opinions and be open-minded to the fact that people can think about things differently than you. I have thought that in my work, one of the most inspiring things has been the fact that my research team has always had people from different disciplines, engineers, physicists, psychologists, some, some medical doctors and so forth. And it's really, really enlightening, for instance, to talk about brain functions with an engineer mm -hmm. or a physicist. And you know, they have really good questions. And the problem is that if I, as a medical doctor, talk about medicine, let's say mostly with, with people with the same background that I have, we are already in our in, in sort of an information bubble. Your it, way of knowing. Uh, yeah, yeah, our way of knowing. But when we take somebody that comes from another discipline together to the, to the discussion, they often give very good, they often ask very good questions. The same is with children. Yeah, They really ask very good questions. And this is actually very interesting that you take this up because I know that in several knowledge-intense companies where they, for instance, are trying to keep the normal structures, formal structures as low as possible and get people to collaborate and, if you like, uh, think together, one of the big challenges is to get people to come away from their own silos of knowing. And this is something that I've been discussing with colleagues that at the university, what we do largely, we teach people to know in a certain way. And like you said, then if you manage to have a team when there is a lot of pe people with different ways of knowing, knowing the world that can, can come together and share, and if you like, let the other person's thought to break that surface for you, then that's the sort of, we know that that's the best kind of thinking you can do together. But the question is that how do you teach this open thinking, this kind of like, that's, the, that's, the, that's our explanation of the world, but now you need to also see that there are other ways of looking at this. And I guess that's the challenge in many with adults, because like you said, children and younger people are still more open. So is there something you can train your brain with to keep it open or? I think that this, this is a very, um, very sort of um, a question that is very important now and also especially in the future. I've often been thinking about how, how to, you know, get a balance of, you know, having a generalist, somebody who knows a bit about everything, and somebody who is very deep into a certain area. And through my own career, I have noticed that my basis is in medicine, and then I'm a neurologist. But due to the fact that I have been working a lot with people from, with different backgrounds, I have some knowledge from, from, you know, engineering, building devices, or the physicists of, of human body functions and so forth. And gradually, uh, 
I have learned to speak with these people in such a way that, you know, we to some extent understand each other. But I can say from my, at least my personal experience has been that it takes quite a long time to get to the level where you start understanding each other because I can give you an example. Yeah, please. I was um, giving a presentation on, on brain health and brain well-being in, in the energy sector, if I remember it correctly. And there was this uh, nuclear power plant being built, uh, this Olkiluoto. And uh, I was there sitting and waiting for my, my turn. And there was an engineer talking, and, and he was saying that the most important thing at the power plant is to take care of the heart. And I was thinking, wow, brilliant. You have to be, take care of the operators who are operating the plant. You have to take care of their heart. And after a couple of you know, sentences, I realized that he meant the heart of the of reactor. The new, the reactor. <laughs> yes. So yeah. we had, we've had a lot of these types of situations. For instance, what does cognition mean to a physicist or an engineer or a psychologist or a, or a medical doctor, or, a, or an economist. It means different things. So it takes time to get to the, uh, to the level of language where you know, you at least to some extent, understand the other person. And I think there's no other way to get there than to ask questions. What do you mean when you are saying heart? What do you mean when you are saying cognition? What is it? What do you think it is? It has to do with many things. And uh, I remember I was told that, you know, Kitty, that is not a very good approach if you want to get a very long, let's say, um, publication list. Mm -hmm. Because it takes time to get a multi-parametric study set up. Uh, are you really serious that you want to start, you know, adding psychology and physicists and engineering and, and, and mobile technology? Wouldn't it be much easier, you know, to do, you know, things in the, in the traditional way, because then it's also easier to get the things published. So there are many things that, you know, are in some way um, challenging us to get outside of our own, let's say, um, information bubbles and, and cocoons. Yeah, and some of the structures are forcing us back in. Exactly. And we can ask that how useful are they? Because we know at the same time that all the sort of speeches at the, at the events and, and if you like, the, the sort of changes in the future work, work are all pushing towards a more multidiscipline approach. So these are something that uh, things that we should all be thinking about, regardless of are we researchers or not like how to open your mind, how to uh, like at least try to understand better what the other person is talking about, even if the word is the same, but the meaning can be different. What I actually, what annoys me actually quite a lot is the fact that we are very much talking about this. Everything is multidisciplinary yes. and so forth. But then everything that is happening actually in practice is against this. Let's take, for instance, uh, education, which is very near to my heart. Uh, the frontal lobes uh, develop until you are 25 to 30 years old, which means this that... This is frontal lobes uh, is... In the brain. Uh, here, in yeah. the front. Okay. Which means that when you are in the, in the teenager age and so forth, many people do not yet know what they want to do you know, when they are adults. And I know many who have thought at that time that they know what they want to do and they got into the education and to find out that they actually want to do something else. Now people are forced to, you know, start making, you know, very big decisions earlier and earlier, while in order to have people that are, as you said, interested in many areas, people should have the opportunity to try different things and have curriculums that have, you know, pieces from, from different universities or communal schools or whatever. But everything has been made very difficult in practice related to this. The only thing that we are hearing about is that if you get yourself, you know, out of the university or so forth in three years or four years, mm. then, you know, you don't have to pay back your student loan. And this, everything is against what we are talking about now. Because in order to, um, as we don't know where the future goes, 
The most imp one of the most important things also, in addition to being uh, conscious about the fact that ultimately you yourself have to take care of yourself, is the fact that you should um, develop a sort of... Um, um, you should be very... Um, now you have to help me, what's the word in English? Uh, you, should be very, you should be very interested mm -hmm. in things that are going around you, mm -hmm. in lots of aware different, of aware, lots of different yeah. types of, of things, which means that in order to do that, you have to try this, that, and that. Different things to, to you know, know what is the thing that makes you tick the best. And also, it might be that this is what lifelong learning is about. Yes. You are learning more things when you are, you know, you c when you get out of the university or another educational system, you hopefully have, you know, gotten the motivation and, and inspiration to keep on learning new things. So it's sort of counteractive to the fact that during your time in working life, you should also constantly be learning new things and trying new things. But we are not at the moment, the, 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 the society is not no. giving us the, the possibilities to do this. No, we're very much like pushing towards these tubes. And, like I, think, paths. and I think that this tube, pushing into tubes, is also one thing that uh, we have a risk of when we are now very much, you know, talking about this remote work. I very much am, am against these different types of myths. At one time, I, you know, tried to, you know, get rid of the myth that people can do multitasking. Uh -huh. And people can't do that because it's actually, you know, hopping from one, one task to another task. And men and women are, are as, you know, good or poor at, you know, hopping from one task to another and back and forth. Why? Oh, Why? Because... If uh, I stop you there, why from the brain perspective? Why because, is that not good? Um, because I'm suspecting that most people watching this have been multitasking or are trying it, it to multitask. Has to do, it has to do with the fact that... Um, if you have several different, let's say, work tasks or projects that you are doing, and you only have, let's say, 15 minutes to do one and you have to jump to the other one, the working memory is very loaded, as well as attentional resources that also are neural networks here in the, in the frontal brain lobe, which means that the risk of, of mixing up uh, content from different work tasks happens or you get really stressed because you have to jump from one task to another, and then at the same time you in some way have to try to remember what you had done with the other task before you switched to the right. other. So it's very uh, challenging for the human, both physiologically as well as cognitively, to adapt from one sort of way of doing things to another. Okay. It's, it's different if you have a big project that has subtasks and you know how you know they are structured. But if you have to go from a totally different work task to another one that is its content and goal is different from the one that you were first doing, then you will have these types of troubles. So what should you do instead of doing multitasking? What, what are we, what's the sort of piece of advice? I think the piece of the advice is that you know you understand that that's not possible and you try to, you know, you know, have time to do at longer least time. a longer time. I would say that minimum an hour to do a certain task. And then I'm very for short, short periods of relaxation or, or recovery. I think you could do it in such a way that, um, first of all, I'm a strong believer in the fact that when people understand how their brain and mind works, they figure it out also for themselves. And I hope that people would discuss with each other their ways of, you know, tackling everyday work types or, or their everyday living and so forth. But one way would be that you have an hour to do a certain thing. Then you take a sort of a recovery phase, let's say 10 minutes. You take a short walk or you go to the coffee area, talk with somebody for a while, or you go out with the dog or whatever. And then you come back and you start the other task. And then I think it would also be a good idea to put some marks or a memo on what is the, le what is the phase that you reached in the first task, and then before you start the next one. Right. And then when you, you know, have the next, let's say, 
10 to 15 minutes uh, recovery phase, and you return to the first task. You don't have to worry, where, where was I when you have written a couple of lines that I reached this point, and then you know where you will, will, right. will, will continue. And this is now obviously we're talking about knowledge work, right? Or I would say that um, all types of work, even okay. even you know handicrafts and things like that, in okay. these also because that there need... I've heard this myth that that's not as that there you could do several things. Ah, I'm glad that you asked about that. So myth busting here, we're myth busting because. Um, be you a carpenter or be you a person who is, you know, preparing food or, or whatever, uh, there are several different things that you are doing. And I know from, you know, looking at people who are good at carpenting that there might be something that they are doing and they have to then, you know, do something. Uh, they have to put some paint or something there and then you have, they have to leave it to dry for, let's say, a couple of days and then they have to start doing something else that is urgent. And that is also similar types of things. If you go to construction places and you know look at builders, they are constantly going from one task to another mm. task. And I must say that if you are not thinking at the same time you know what you are doing, you very soon notice that you have put the wrong type of wood in the wrong type of place, or you have put the bricks or whatever to a place where you know you cannot you know put them where you're supposed to put them and then you have to you know take an ex take an extra hundred meters for instance to change the place where the bricks are so in all types of tasks you need thinking if you are in service and you have a you have a customer who all of a sudden has a problem it requires everyday problem solving so then you try to solve the problem of one of your customers and then you are in a call center and other one calls and says that I have this type of a problem. Then you try to solve that problem and the first customer contacts you again and says that it didn't work. What would be the next phase? Isn't this the same thing? It's not the, just the so-called, I don't know. I think there's parts and elements of knowledge work in all types of you know, yeah. tasks and in everyday life. We so, all the time encounter So this. our takeaway from this, if I am interpreting you right, is that in order to take care of your brain, you want to, whatever you do, we want to make sure that you have a longer time to work on it and then you have a break before you do something else. Rather than hopping from one thing to another, what we're all doing now, particularly with the equipment that we have. This hopping from one thing to another happens all the time. You have this kind of thing in your 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 lap, and um, well, you first do some work, then you hop into the Facebook, you hop into Instagram, you hop into the newspaper, and and you you can and you're, what you're saying essentially, am I hearing this right? Can we say this? That's not good for your brain. Yes, uh, with a couple of exceptions. Okay, <clears throat> there are very interesting research papers related to the fact of you know. Uh, what can help you to concentrate? Okay. We talked about this a bit before this this, this session. That uh, it has been studied quite nicely that if somebody is listening to some you know information and and is supposed to you know listen to you know handle quite a lot of information that is coming via audio via speech, if you doodle or you do something with your hands it helps you to concentrate. So it might look from the outside that, oh, this person is not, you know, listening at all to what is going on because the person is, you know, scribbling or, or, or knitting or something like that. But actually, if a person is, let's say, at a lecture and listening to um, some new knowledge that they have to, you know, you know uh, digest, Working with their hands often helps to concentrate. Right. If you compare it to the fact that you are told, now, just listen, don't do anything you know right. with your hands or something That's like that. It's very interesting. I'm always doodling when I'm listening to someone. I'm yeah. always drawing little pictures. That's an interesting piece of knowledge. I didn't know that. But if I'm kind of, um, we're talking about the same theme now, but um, taking care of your brain when you're 
with, with the, all this new equipment um, during this extraordinary time that we're all living. Can you see, from your perspective, a change in attitudes when it comes to work life? I don't know if we can even separate those two anymore, working life, life, work and life, and, um, and brains, and, and basically the way we look at these things now during COVID? Is there I, more? I don't know. Um, I think that we do not yet exactly know what this COVID lockdown will do because there are so many different elements. For instance, people react to it, let's say, from the mental health perspective also very differently. Uh, but um, first of all, I would still like to add one thing to this multitasking thing yeah, because yeah. Um, the main point is the, a, the possibility to prioritize what is relevant in your work. And here you often meet other people. You have to discuss the things with your co-workers or let's say those who are, who are you, know, you know, have bought the service from you if you are a freelancer. You have to discuss with them what is the most important, high priority thing that you have to do. And this prioritization is a thing that very often you, you sort of figure it out best when you are able to talk it or talk, talk about it with another person. And I think this is something that is missing now very much during this remote type of work, that many people think that others don't have time to, you know, have a Teams meeting for me, with me, just to, you know, prioritize what we want to do. That's one thing. And the other thing is that I'm, I don't want to sound unrealistic because people are in situations where they have just too much to do. But the only way to tackle that is to be able to say that, you know, my plate is full, I cannot take any more, that you, you have to know how to say no. And that is a fact that is very much has to do with trust. Mm -hmm. If you are in a workplace and environment where you have trust, where you are not afraid to say, that, you know, this is just over the board, that I, I just cannot manage this much of stuff to do. Uh, then you can, you know, talk about this. And you asked, have there been some changes? I think that this has gone to the, bet to the better in working life. We have many places where, where people and, and, and um, leaders and even CEOs understand that there's a limit to what a certain person can do. But some people are, or many are, still stuck with the idea that you can never say no. If you say no, you are the one who are next, you know, in the group that, it, that is being laid off. And then I'm always, you know, hearing that, Kitty, you, you are the best person to talk about that. I mean, you are so unrealistic when you say, when I say to these people that, mm -hmm. if you are in a workplace, that doesn't value human beings and doesn't let you say the enough is enough. Maybe that's not, maybe that workplace is, you know, not good enough for you. Maybe you should change the workplace. Then we come to the fact, how can you change your workplace? There, there is the issue that if you have tried several different things, you have several different options, then you can start looking around at other opportunities, you know, jumping to doing something totally different. And then I still want to go back to this work cake thing. Right. Um, we have people who have too much to do. They don't know, you know, the day is never, there are never enough hours. And I very much talk, I've very much worked with people who have had working ability issues, who can, for instance, work part-time. And I've tried to, you know, visualize it in such a way that we have a work environment or a workplace with a certain cake that has to be done, a work cake. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if we think that there are 10 slices and they all have to be the same size, then there's somebody for whom his or her slice is absolutely too big. And the other starts saying, no, you have to do your part. Everybody does, does as much as the other. Then this person gets overstressed and is 
in the risk of you know having to go to a sick leave or you yeah. know even loses working ability. What is the end result usually? You have the same work cake, but you don't have 10 people anymore. You have nine people who have to divide the same work cake again. While you could do it in such a way that you could have two people who are part-time ability. They can work part-time and they could take one of the slices. And I'm still sort of amazed that this, this sort of uh, image and you know this practical thing, this work cake, how you divide it. Mm -hmm. I can't get this through. But I'm think, I'm workers. Think, yeah, I'm thinking. I'm listening to you. I'm hearing. Um, I'm hearing what we've got a lot of good advice in terms of that you need to think of yourself and holisticity of your being, and also your work and and managing yourself and putting limits. But also from the organizational press perspective, if I'm hearing you correctly, it would be in organizations' interest also to think a bit more who does what and how much rather than just slicing the cake. So if you like slicing the cake smarter, is that what you're kind of saying? Yes. And this is and, and the, the and argument is, behind the it. The, ar the argument behind this is that if we continue the way we have with these tools and equipments and this kind of rhythm of work that we're now, well, we've been operating with for some time now, we're not going to. It's not going to be sustainable. We exactly. are going to burn out. Exactly. And actually, here's a very good. Uh, sort of a um, stepping stone to the next topic, which is that there has also been this myth that technology takes and automation takes care of things. You know, when things are automated, yeah. then, you know, people don't have so much to do. But I can say from 25, 30 years of experience in a huge amount of different types of working places, there is always an important role for the human being. It's the humans, there their sort of uh, alert, well-rested brains and minds that innovate and create new things and solve problems. I've been in several workplaces and several industries where many things have been automated. And I remember a very smart uh, automation engineer who once said to me, that Kitty, the smart thing is not to automate. The smart thing is to figure out what not to automate, which means that in the end, when you know everything starts beeping and there are red signs and you know something mm. is you know wrong in the in the automation process, the person the, the it's not the system, at least not yet, that you know corrects itself. It's then the people mm -hmm. who are monitoring the thing. And in order to monitor it and understand where the problem is, you cannot automate everything because you lose situational awareness. This is also something that technology researchers are criticizing us who don't build robots for our everyday work, that they say that we are oddly critique less when it comes to taking technologies in and deciding these levels of automation, etc., that we should be much more smart in thinking like what part of the a job can be given to a machine and what part should I be focusing on. But if we go back to the brain, um, what would you now focus on if you want to, as a student or as an employee of an individual level, kind of preserve your cognition, your brain, keep it as sort of well-rested and well-functioning so that you could go forward and, and um, if you like, work smarter, not harder. So what would, you, what would you focus on? First of all, we are individuals and we have other different ways of, of recovering and relaxing. I think that um, if you want some thumb rules that work to some extent, yeah. you could say that if you are doing work where you have to do a lot of thinking and writing and reading, or you are doing very complex tasks with your hands and so forth, I would say that taking a short break minimum after two hours and, not, and you should not work, you know, all the time, uh, more than four hours. I would say that a short break after two hours would be good. I would also say that um, I hope that the working, ways of working would, would evolve in, uh, in such a way that we would understand that it is 
overall good for a person's, um, let's say, performance and, and quality of performance if the person has the ability to have minimum three, hopefully four short 10-minute breaks during the workday so that it would not be so intensely packed. And this would be preferable to the fact that you first, you know, do, you do a very intensive day and then you think that, okay, now I still have to go to the gym for one hour or I have to go and run for one hour. It would be, from my, in my opinion, it would be better to have four times ten minutes recovery. And then when you end your workday, you still have energy to do also other things. If you are totally, you know, wasted and, you know, think that I've given everything and I don't have energy to do anything else at home than, you know, sitting on the couch and, you know, just, you know, think about nothing or, or look at mm. something on the TV, then, then you should, you know, have the bells ringing in your, in your head that it has been too intensive. Too much. Too much. And in order to understand and figure out how I could change something, you need you need sort of companions. And you should also be aware about the fact that we we sort of we are we are we are we are individuals of habit. Mm -hmm. The brain uh, the brain develops habits. We need habits, you know, we need things that are done in a certain way. Think about the fact that, you know, every morning you would have to start thinking, how do I brush my teeth and mm. uh, how do I, you know, make my coffee and so forth. These are, you know, habits. But in the same way, we develop work mm -hmm. habits. And in order to change something, if you feel that, you know, you have to change it, then you have to remember that it's also a learning process to get, learn out from a bad habit in order to replace it with a better habit. And also, if we come back to this digital thing and technology, I'm all for technology in certain work tasks. But you then have to understand that the work that the person is doing changes. It's not so that, you know, you get this technology system and you start doing it and your work doesn't change. It always changes. And what I would really like to have in future workplaces are people that are experts in the, in the content work content that will then be full day, nearly full day, working together with those who are developing the technologies that, that will be then, you know, put into the... Put right, in, so in, that it would be adapted. Yeah. But this is something that there is a strong research consensus on, a global research consensus that in order for our work, future work to be more socially sustainable, we really need to adapt better and not expect that the technology is going, somehow going to on its own solve our problems. But I think that I have two comments. I, I, I had find it highly interesting what you said about the, and that's a very, that's a nice tip also to all of us, these short breaks. Because I actually not long ago had a full day of training. I was the teacher and I had students virtually. And I insisted on having a 15 minute break once in an hour. And in the end of the day, several of them commented that they don't feel completely exhausted. That they were at first thinking that maybe the breaks were too long, but now they're actually thinking that, that, that usually after a long day of virtual training, you feel very tired. Now they didn't. So now I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm hearing that I've done something that is actually like brain-friendly for my students. Yeah. And think about school. When I was in school, we had, you know, the, the, the lessons and then we had 15 minutes or 20 minute break and we went outside. I mean, that was fantastic. And actually, coffee breaks, lunch breaks and so forth, don't, don't miss them. And one thing that I also would like to point out when we are talking about the future of work, I think that we are stuck with this 24-7 open global world and we have these timeless and spaceless interactions. I'm... I'm not saying that, you know, we will not get rid of them. And I'm, I'm a strong believer with the fact that we will also adapt to this. But we have to understand that we have to figure out in which, which instances it is a good way to go forward. But the tricky thing for us humans and brain health and overall health as such is 
that if you are constantly uh, on teams or interacting with people around the globe early in the morning, late in the evening, and your own circadian rhythm, which means your own sleep-wake rhythm, gets disrupted. Mm -hmm. That, if that continues for long periods of time, it has health risks. And if we think about our society, one of the most, and now I will say it out loud, one of the most stupid things we have is this every half year switching of, 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 of clocks mm -hmm. because it disrupts sleep-wake cycle. But, and we talk about that, but that's not the only thing. We know that our, our body ha has a multitude of so-called biological clocks. We are an orchestra of biological clocks. Our heart, our liver, our gastrointestinal tract, uh, our kidneys, our brain, and whatever, all have their biological clocks. Even our skin mm -hmm. has its own circadian rhythm. So if we, you know, artificially start changing the master clock, which is here in the brain, which is the conductor of the brain's, of the, of the body's uh, biological clock orchestra, it soon starts to go out of tune. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why it takes for some people quite a long time, you know, to get again going on and uh, adjusting because also our cognition and our cognitive performance is also, you know, um, affected by these right. clocks as well as our physical performance. So it might be that your sleep rhythm isn't so much disrupted, but you are wondering why am I having these odd stomach aches and why am I, you know, wanting mm -hmm. to eat at a, you know, abnormal time. It has to do with the fact that your gastrointestinal tract is still in the old way old of time. Your, old time. And I think this is one of the critical things yeah. in modern life, that if you are very often out of tune of your own circadian rhythm, how do you get back to it? Because research that I have been leading has shown that if a person has a week that is um, a sort of a week where you can only sleep four to five hours per Per, per night, night yeah. so it's an intensive week and it could be simulated like you know you have these meetings early in the morning and late in the evening it takes two and a half days to recover and it takes your metabolism and your immune system three weeks to recover to recover so the risk if this continues for getting diabetes or getting infections and so forth it increases. So we should really think about how we tackle this situation where we have global co global companies. Global teams, and, yeah. And global teams. So what I'm hearing here is that the brain-friendly, uh, people-friendly, holistic approach in organization would entail small breaks during the workday that are somehow nudged for it so that it's not left on the individual and also this like time element is being thought about in a more sort of holistic way and understood as a well-being question. Yes, and I think that um, if we think about um, new working hours, mm. <clears throat> I think we could take this into account in such a way that if somebody has an early morning or late evening meeting, for instance, the person could the next day take as a recovery day, and not in such a way that many people tell me that they come home very late in the evening. And then, you know, they have to be, you know, ship shape early in the morning at eight o'clock in the morning. And this has not changed no. during this COVID period. The only difference is that you are not flying, but you can still have these early morning and late evening yeah. meetings. And, and so remote work does not solve this. But if you would have a consensus that if you have this type of a situation, you could then recover the next day because many people are sort of, um, uh, they are so um, conscious, work conscious, that they get ba a bad conscious yeah. if, you know, they take it easy the next day. Conscientious workers, yeah. they, that, and so are you, are you saying that to be a conscientious worker, you should take better care of your rest time as well? Yes. 
Um, I think that we're uh, kind of reaching um, the end of our time here, but I think that we've received a lot of good advice, um, concrete advice, and um, perspectives that uh, we perhaps some of them were familiar with, and we've also busted some myths. But is there something that I haven't asked, something central about brain health to consider, to think about, to, to do? I'm thinking now that, for instance, you say that recover and, and take a day off would you be recovering and taking a day off if you're looking at your equipment all day? Or would, like, there's, I, I've heard a lot of this discussion of like that your brain cannot rest if you're looking at a screen. I think that uh, everybody has to find their own way to recover. And I think the main point is to take time to, first of all, learn about these things. I think that already from, you know, early age in school, through university and also then further education in workplaces, you should constantly also talk about human health, well-being and this brain, mind, heart, body connection and remind people that they ultimately themselves have to, you know, value themselves so that, you know, they, they, they take care of these issues. And this is, I think, the most important thing. And then listening to yourself. And there are several things uh, like um, if you start to be grumpy, if you start to um, f get annoyed by other people, or if you start to see everything, you know, more black than it is, and somebody says that, why, why don't you see the positive things going around? then I think that it's a time point where you should, you know, sit down and, and think about the fact that is there something in my everyday life, working life, and so forth that I should, you know, think about and change. But as a medical doctor, I also have to remind that if somebody is overstressed, fatigued, and thinks that, you know, the performance is going down, there might be also some medical reason. So, before you know, you start saying that, you know, I just have too much thi many things to do. Go and have your blood sugar checked or, or your thyroid or, or your blood pressure and so forth, because it might be something treatable. And it's really, really, you know, sad if, let's say, a full-blown already diabetes is underdiagnosed for long mm -hmm. periods of time because we nowadays have really good treatments for these uh, several different types of metabolic things. Yeah. But the main point is that know yourself and ask the other one also how are you doing and don't you know don't you know how, how don't be pleased with you know the answer well you know it's going quite fine or okay no problem ask a bit more. I once was in the elevator in the States, and, and uh, again there came some people in and they asked me how I am. And they were really surprised when I started, you know, telling yeah. what's going on today. The Anglo-Saxon culture doesn't and, include and, that. And they were they sort expected of, to say, I'm fine. Yeah. And, well, I saw that they were sort of... Um, Oh, what shall we do here? <laughs> but they, it was only four four levels in the elevator that they had to, you know, cope yes. with my <laughs> your story, <laughs> my story. <laughs> but uh, what I'm hearing that uh, the, the, this session has been very, very interesting to talk to you. Mm -hmm. And what I'm actually quite fascinated by is that uh, that you coming from the brain research perspective. But what I'm hearing is take care of yourself holistically, mm -hmm. and 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 I guess that's the organizational advice as well take care of people holistically, think about the whole and, and not just the brain. It's a part of everything else. And we need to kind of be uh, smarter about the way we do things. And I think that the lifespan issue is also very important. You have to think about these in young children, people who are in school. And we also, for instance, know that uh, older people who are, you know, physically more active than others, their risk of getting uh, memory diseases of the brain is lower. Mm -hmm. So I think this has to do with people of, of all ages. 
And then perhaps one thing also would be at the end is that um, we have many people who have too many th things to do. And then we have people who cannot find their place in working life. We should really put thought into the fact that we would have work tasks that people that are not so into, you know, formal education and so forth would also have the possibility to learn to do things through working life, working. And I think that that is something that in this hectic time uh, is in, in many ways missing. I agree. I couldn't agree more. And that's something actually that there is also a fairly large global research consensus that we really should be thinking about this thing on societal, organizational and individual level. So it's a great point to end our discussion. But thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And sharing with us your, your knowledge. And uh, hope to see you soon, the next time. Thank you very much. Thank you.